Hi, and welcome. I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, Presbyterian Minister of three congregations in Eastern Ontario, and thank you for joining us for this week's Puzzles in Faith. The question this week has to deal with communion, Holy Communion, the Last Supper, um, Eucharist, however you want to refer to it. Are we supposed to use wine or grape juice? And what's the difference and why do both traditions exist? So, in Hebrew, the word yayin for wine can refer to either fermented or unfermented grapes. That much we know. But the Bible itself doesn't seem to have anything against alcohol. Jesus turned the wine, water into wine was his first miracle, and it was the good stuff. So we can assume that it was fermented and had some kind of kick. The early church, um, or let's go back, when Jesus came to Jerusalem that last week and he celebrated the Last Supper, it was part of a Jewish Seder Passover meal. And wine is very much part of that service. So there's no reason to think Jesus did not use wine at his Last Supper. The early church had no problem using wine, preferably red wine, because that would remind us of the blood. Remember, the wine is supposed to represent Jesus's blood and the bread is his body. And so the early church had both as communion. But something happened along the way. And as Christianity spread north, it spread into areas where wine was not easy to come by. You don't find vineyards in England or uh, Norway, Sweden, Scandinavia. Beer is sort of the drink of choice there. And so wine was too expensive for everyone. It had to be brought in, imported. And so you had this tradition emerged where the priests, the monks, the nuns, they could get the bread and the wine, but everyone else just got the bread, which was by this time a wafer. And that was the situation through to the Protestant Reformation. Another thing happened along the way too, as people no longer spoke Latin, and the church service was in Latin, they really didn't understand what was going on or what was being said or what was happening. Their understanding of Christianity left a lot to be desired. And so you started having a curtain. What the communion service was done behind the curtain. And again, those on the other side of the curtain got the bread the ones on this side who understood what was happening got both bread and wine. It, part of the Protestant Reformation was get rid of the curtain. Everyone should see, everyone should know the Bible, and everyone should get both bread and wine. And that was the norm throughout the Protestant Reformation up until the 19th century. Now, in the 19th century, now in, among the Roman Catholics, you still had that separation. Even today, people generally do not get both bread and wine uh, at communion. They might, certain times of the year, like around Easter, you might get both. When you're confirmed, you might get both. But other times on a weekly basis, you probably will only get the, the wafer. Protestant denominations, we get both. In the 19th century, something happened in North America. And we're not going to go into the history of the temperance movement, but there were certain abuses going on. And the temperance movement grew out of that, was saying, these men are hurting people, they're destroying families, they are they're abusing spouses we have to get them to stop drinking so you had this this movement 
of saying alcohol is bad and then going back to the Bible and you can find passages that show that if you're drinking too much, bad things do happen. And so you had some denominations that became convinced that Christians should not drink alcohol. Those are like the Methodists and the Baptists and offshoots. And that communion was really grape juice, even back in Jesus's day. Now the jury is out on that, that and how biblical it is. It doesn't seem to be uh, that biblical, but that's what they're saying. In the 20th century, other Protestant denominations began taking a look at what was going on. And in the old days, in the old days, you had basically a cauldron or a pot being rolled down the aisles and take a scoop. That's a lot of alcohol, a lot of wine. And if it's strong, pretty good, pretty good stuff. First thing in the morning, mm, you might be a little tipsy. Well, you might get a little drunk and cause a car accident. And that's no good. I mean, no one wants that. And we certainly don't want to be the cause of that happening. We also went to Common Cup. There, you're going to, you can still get a good chug of wine, but it's going to be a lot less because the cup is going to last for several people. It's also pretty well, it's sterilized because alcohol is going to sterilize the cup. But we didn't want to get people drunk enough that they could have a car accident. And we also began to, to be concerned about alcoholics people who were fighting alcoholism and you know we're trying to stay how many days they since they've had their last drink and we just didn't want them getting drunk we didn't want to push them off the wagon as the expression is and so we went to grape juice common cup and grape juice not sterile you're going to get sick pass the germs around we went to individual cups now, sometimes you had individual cups and wine. You're not gonna really get anyone drunk on this much wine, but you could get someone off the wagon. So more denominations today, like the United Church, the Presbyterian, we use grape juice. Other denominations, like the Lutherans, the Roman Catholics, and the Eastern Orthodox, uh, denominations, they use wine. The wine should be pure, no additives, no artificial coloring. Some people will use white wine because if you've got a stain, you can, it's not as noticeable. We usually have a white tablecloth for communion services. Red stain on white tablecloth, very noticeable. White stain on white tablecloth, we can get away with it. So you do have uh, uh, some churches going for white wine. But that explains sort of what's going on and why. What did Jesus use? Probably wine. Should we use wine? It's up to the denomination to set the standards. When you're at home, you can use whatever you want. Um, it's the symbolism of what is being done in the act of communion and what uh, the wine represents or grape juice. That doesn't change regardless of what uh, alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage you use. So I hope you find that interesting. And uh, next week's question is about Judas Iscariot. Is he damned or was he doing God's will? Hmm. Tough question. See you next week. Take care and God bless.